I would fly into major cities, look out the window and think, why is it so dark out there? Where are all the lights? I'd see if this were New York, Paris, or Beijing. In Lagos, Nigeria, I traveled down unlit streets where people were huddling around fires they had built in old oil barrels. In remote villages, Melinda and I met women and girls who spent hours every day collecting firewood so they could cook over an open flame in their homes. We met kids who did their homework by candlelight because their homes didn't have electricity. I learned that about a billion people didn't have reliable access to electricity and that half of them lived in sub-Saharan Africa. The picture has improved a bit since then. Today, roughly 860 million people don't have electricity. I thought about our foundation's motto. Everyone deserves the chance to live a healthy and productive life and how it's hard to stay healthy if your local medical clinic can't keep vaccines cold because the refrigerators don't work. It's hard to be productive if you don't have lights to read by. And it's impossible to build an economy where everyone has job opportunities if you don't have massive amounts of reliable, affordable electricity for offices, factories, and call centers. Around the same time, the late scientist David McKay, a professor at Cambridge University, shared a graph with me that showed the relationship between income and energy use. A country's per capita income and the amount of electricity used by its people. The chart plotted various countries' per capita income on one axis and energy consumption on the other, and made it abundantly clear to me that the two go together. You can view a similar graph in your downloadable PDF plotting energy consumption and income per person. The connection is unmistakable. As all this information sank in, I began to think about how the world could make energy affordable and reliable for the poor. It didn't make sense for our foundation to take on this huge problem. We needed it to stay focused on its core mission. But I started kicking around ideas with some inventor friends of mine. I read more deeply on the subject, including several eye-opening books by the scientist and historian Voslav Smil, who helped me understand just how critical energy is to modern civilization. At the time, I didn't understand that we needed to get to zero. The rich countries that are responsible for most emissions were starting to pay attention to climate change, and I thought that would be enough. My contribution, I believed, would be to advocate for making reliable energy affordable for the poor. For one thing, they have the most to gain from it. Cheaper energy would mean not only lights at night, but also cheaper fertilizer for their fields and cement for their homes. And when it comes to climate change, the poor have the most to lose. The majority of them are farmers who already live on the edge and can't withstand more droughts and floods. Things changed for me in late 2006 when I met with two former Microsoft colleagues who were starting nonprofits focused on energy and climate. They brought along two climate scientists who were well versed in the issues, and the four of them showed me the data connecting greenhouse gas emissions to climate change. I knew that greenhouse gases were making the temperature rise but I had assumed that there were cyclical variations or other factors that would naturally prevent a true climate disaster. And it was hard to accept that as long as humans kept emitting any amount of greenhouse gases, temperatures would keep going up. I went back to the group several times with follow-up questions. Eventually it sank in. The world needs to provide more energy so the poorest can thrive. But we need to provide that energy without releasing any more greenhouse gases. Now the problem seemed even harder. It wasn't enough to deliver cheap, reliable energy for the poor. It also had to be...